Okay, thanks a lot. I, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers for the invitation. It's always good to uh, come back to DC. For me, this is where uh, a lot of this started uh, for me in terms of um, actually applying this knowledge and, and um, working on developing uh, these tests. So today I'm going to uh, talk some about using DNA to explore ancestry in African descent populations in the New World. And, and uh, when we talk about the New World, I think we, we forget sometimes that there were folk who were here before we got here, <laughs> right? So, so the indigenous uh, uh, populations uh, of the New World and their genetic uh, or gene pool, um, there are still remnants of that in, in the uh, genetics of uh, folks today. But after the uh, arrival of uh, uh, Christoph, or whatever you want to call him, uh, he, he brought with him a lot of uh, uh, changes that occurred uh, in the New World. And uh, one of the big um, um, uh, consequences of the uh, arrival of Europeans in the New World was the uh, enslavement and the uh, forced migration, or, or kidnapping actually, of enslaved uh, West and, and Central Africans um, who uh, came throughout the, the New World, right? I mean, came to um, several regions of the New World from, from West and Central Africa. So today I'm gonna place the uh, genetics of African descent populations in the New World into several contexts. Because when we talk about genetics, I think we, we have to remember that um, th this is just one uh, uh, tool, uh, one piece of information uh, from multiple sources of information. So I'm, I'm sure all of the speakers, uh, the genetic speakers today, are not espousing any genetic uh, exceptionalism. Uh, I know I'm not, but I, I do want to uh, stress that it is uh, a powerful tool uh, that could inform and uh, could allow one to reconcile um, uh, individual, uh, fam familial, and, um, and, and geographic ancestry. So today I'm gonna to talk about the, place it into historical context. We talk about the, uh, the expansion and the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the bottleneck of um, the Native American component, European uh, colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. Social political um, context because there is no monolithic uh, African American or African descent population. I mean, there are different local experiences. And when we look at the genetics, uh, a lot of that arrives because of the differences in the uh, local experiences across the new world. And then the psychological, because folks identify themselves and you have the right to identify yourselves how you are, whether you're Tiger Woods or, or Rick Kittles, you know, you say what you are, right? Uh, a Cablasian or, or whatever, right? So when we look at the, uh, these populations in, in the Americas, we know that there's high genetic heterogeneity. And I, I think that um, uh, we, we've uh, mentioned that earlier, uh, due to the antiquity of the, uh, of the gene pool of, of Africans, and then also gene flow and admixture with non-African populations. And uh, th this admixture can increase linkage and equilibrium, which you'll learn more about uh, uh, in the next session. Um, and we know that the pattern va of variation, of genetic variation, differs geographically across the New World. And we also know that there's high levels of, of population stratification. So when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we're talking about the, uh, the, the forced kidnapping of, of, of uh, folks from northern Senegal, southern Angola for the most part, 5% of enslaved Africans in this region coming over to, uh, the, to uh, being forced over into the New World, mainly the Caribbean and South America. Only about half a million were brought to North America. The bulk of them, four and a half million or more actually, uh, to the Caribbean and uh, uh, South America. And so when we, um, uh, 10 years ago, when I really started working on this and, and, and uh, set up the, the company African Ancestry, we were using the Sekulink markers. Uh, now they're kind of going out of favor, but uh, they still were quite informative for uh, tracing migration patterns and saying something about ancestry. These sex link markers being mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, which are paternally and maternally inherited. Uh, this is a paper that I did with Mark Shriver where we you know, showed the, the different mitochondrial DNA lineages that have emerged uh, as um, populations moved out of Africa. 
Very interesting stories they tell, but they only tell one particular story out of many. And I think we really need to understand that. Um, uh, uh, Joanna showed, uh, um, when you look at your ancestors as you go back in time, it, it, it's, uh, it can increase enormously. And so we can't tell you everything about all of those ancestors, but we can say something um, very um, uh, um, concretely and, and uh, about particular um, uh, lineages when we use these, these, uh, these markers. So 10 years ago, we started offering these, this DNA test for African Americans, um, and we were using the Y chromosome polymorphisms and mitochondrial DNA polymorphisms. Now we have uh, some, what we call admixture markers, which are autosomal markers, uh, which represent a mixture of your, of your gene pool from uh, multiple sources in your family tree. We call it the MyDNA mix, which I think is interesting. You know, it's, it's a nice name, right? <laughs> Issues. Issues surrounding reliability of results. And so when we, we talk about these lineage-based tests, you know, the, 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 it's a function of how comprehensive your database is, right? So you need a large number of genetic data. The sampling has to be consistent with the historical record. So we have a database called the African Lineage Database, where we worked with archaeologists, anthropologists, and historians to, to say, well, you know, what populations, what present-day populations are going to be important to sample for ancestry for African Americans? And then when you talk about the accuracy of these lineage matches, this, we have this sequence similarity measure, and then we also look at the uh, frequency of these matched haplotypes, I mean, the, the, yeah, the matched um, um, haplotypes that we find. Because uh, for the most part, when we look through our database, we find multiple matches across multiple ethnic groups across multiple regions. A lot of them are, are single sort of matches, but then we find some that cluster that have a um, uh, high frequency in a particular region. Well, we can come up with a statistic in terms of probability to say that's the most likely uh, uh, um, uh, place of ancestry. So we, we use those, those uh, statistical uh, measures for, um, uh, for our matches. Our, our database uh, currently, over 14,000 mitochondrial uh, lineages, over 16,000 Y chromosome. Uh, as I said, we started this uh, 10 years ago in 2003. So we were using uh, a small set of molecular markers, uh, of genetic markers, uh, but they were quite informative for um, uh, saying something about African uh, maternal and paternal uh, ancestry. When we look at the uh, genetic distances and geographic and linguistic differences in the database, we found that for mitochondrial DNA, there was uh, um, a close correlation with geography. So the closer individuals were, of course, the more they shared genetically. Uh, and language wasn't correlated with uh, uh, maternal um, uh, 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 mitochondrial DNA. So quick story, uh, Jake told you earlier about the, the work that they were doing with um, uh, looking at uh, autosomal markers uh, and, uh, and, and looking in South Carolina, finding the match uh, with the, um, uh, in the, uh, what we call the Guinea Coast or the, um, uh, the Senegambia, Sierra Leone, Liberian Coast area uh, of West Africa. Uh, we also found a, um, uh, a similar story for the Y chromosome, and we looked at um, several uh, uh, y, cr uh, y chromosome um, samples of, from African Americans uh, in the U.S. So this is that black rice hypothesis, where there were regional differences in the enslaved Africans based on the principal cash crop uh, of the um, plantation. Um, and it may have led to the geographic stratification in the African-American gene pool. So South Carolina, the, the principal crop in the antebellum period was rice. Um, and we know that uh, the uh, Grain Coast West Africans had considerable expertise in rice cultivation. And so that, um, the, many historians believe that the plantation owners in South Carolina preferred enslaved Africans from the Grain Coast. And so this would be this area here, uh, Senegal, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Um, uh, this is what we call the Upper Guinea Coast, uh, some call. Um, we uh, had, had uh, paternal um, lineage data from those populations. We compared them to other African populations, and uh, we wanted to see sort of where the African, um, uh, these Y chromosomes from African American men uh, and also Caribbean uh, men uh, um, matched. Uh, we found that about 30 to 40 percent of the uh, men that we, uh, we tested for the, the ancestry of their Y chromosomes had European Y chromosomes. It's not shocking, I actually have a European Y chromosome. I don't tell folks at dinner all the time, but it is, it did happen. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm part of that 30%. And that also, and I think uh, based on some discussions earlier this week with, uh, with uh, several of you guys in here, you know, that's, that's 
uh, part of, uh, um, uh, that's evidence of the behavior of slaveholders uh, to, to some extent uh, in uh, the history of the African um, uh, uh, experience in the Americas. So when we look at the uh, geographic uh, uh, structuring within West Africa, it's pretty high for the Y chromosome when we look across the different regions that we sampled from. Um, and when we uh, looked at the African Americans from South Carolina, this was uh, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, there was close affinity with the Grain Coast populations, the, the Mandinka from Senegal, the Mende and Temne from Sierra Leone, and the crew from uh, Liberia. So it did provide some evidence uh, for this uh, 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 black rice sort of hypothesis. Uh, and and um, I'm glad to see that Ancestry.com is, is, uh, is affirming and uh, what, we've, what we found um, um, some time ago. So when we look at these autosomal markers, this is these are, these are markers that um, uh, we get from multiple, you know, in our family tree, these, they, they, there's no sort of clear pattern of inheritance, but they allow us to um, say something about your overall global ancestry, and you'll, you'll learn more about that, um, uh, how we can use these markers uh, to um, inform us about um, ancestry and risk for disease uh, in the next session. But um, if we look at um, individuals type for these markers in, in a principal component uh, analysis, we can see that um, um, the, the red represent African uh, Americans in, in uh, Chicago, the blue represent whites in Chicago, green are uh, Europeans, and black are uh, Nigerian West Africans. You, you see sort of that, um, that spread of ancestry there, uh, so the, across those uh, first two uh, principal uh, components. But you do see that there's significant overlap, too. And so um, what they represent is that uh, the, the, the spread of ancestry, as you've seen in the previous two talks, is, 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 quite, rock, is quite wide. And so you, you really shouldn't go home thinking that genetics is actually re reifying or reinforcing race. In fact, it's actually, uh, if you look at it, it's actually breaking down um, these, these racial categories and showing that we all sort of uh, um, uh, have this continuum of genetic variation. So using ancestry informative markers, we can accurately estimate individual ancestry and uh, all populations, not just uh, admixed populations, all populations for the most part show variation in individual ancestry levels. Uh, yeah, I, I kid Mark Shriver a lot because you know, he has significant African ancestry. He, he won't tell me where he got it from, but you know, <laughs> he's significant. You have, what, several of these uh, so-called West African alleles. Um, uh, and you're, what, are you Irish? Oh, somebody said something earlier today about black Irish, so. <laughs> <laughs> these estimates can be used to control for heterogeneity or, or uh, in admixed uh, uh, populations in our, in our genetic association studies, uh, matching our cases and controls, and then also admixture mapping. This is just a plot using structure um, uh, Joanna mentioned structure as a program used for estimating ancestry. On this x-axis are individuals, and this is the proportion of ancestry. These are West Africans from Cameroon, whites from Baltimore, and blacks from DC. These are all self-report, so you see sort of this homogeneity and genetic background um, in the West Africans, uh, the, the green representing European ancestry, and the, um, the, the what I call variants in genetic background for high variance of genetic background for the African Americans. Uh, on average, about 23% European ancestry. So some individuals have very uh, uh, high levels of West African ancestry, some have very high levels of European ancestry. And this is very important, in particular if, if you are involved in, let's say, a clinical trial or a genetic study where, where, where um, genes are involved in, uh, in, in the study, you really have to control for that heterogeneity uh, in the uh, African American population. Uh, and African Americans are not the only ones. These are uh, Hispanics. Uh, Puerto Ricans, you see, the spread of ancestry is quite different. The distribution of African ancestry in Puerto Ricans, quite different than uh, Mexican uh, um, uh, populations, uh, which have a lot more um, Native American ancestry than the, the Puerto Rican population. We look across the United States, uh, the average European ancestry in different African American communities varies. The lowest we saw was in the Gullah Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina, the highest 10 times that in Seattle, uh, Washington. And folks used to say to me, why do I like to go to Seattle? Um, it was, you know, my blood pressure goes down, folks are, you know, a bit more nicer, cab stop for me, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you know. It's different than in the rural south um, 
Uh, but anyway, if you look at these, uh, the numbers, they're, they're, the, the amount of European ancestry in the African American populations is quite low compared to the urban north and then also the, uh, the west coast. Quickly, Africans in the Caribbean, uh, we know that about 10 million enslaved Africans were brought to the Americas, about 4 million sent to the Caribbean, 1.5 million were, were, were sold in the British West Indies. If we look at Jamaica, Barbados, and St. Thomas, we can see uh, a widespread of genetic ancestry, um, just like we see in the African Americans, uh, uh, Jamaicans having a bit more Native American ancestry than the other two uh, groups that we studied. Um, if we look at um, uh, some islands that my uh, uh, postdoc, uh, who now is at um, uh, University of Notre Dame, uh, uh, we uh, looked at Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA and also um, autosomal markers in these populations and found that the highest uh, amount of African ancestry on the Y chromosome, I mean, not African ancestry, those that had the largest proportion of African contribution on their paternal lineages was uh, St. Kitts, and the lowest was in Dominica, which is really, uh, um, they, uh, the island has a, a lot of remnants of the, um, uh, the native uh, uh, American communities that were in those, on those islands. Um, but for the maternal uh, ancestry, uh, the bulk of it being West African on those islands. We look at the, um, uh, the ancestry informative markers, the autosomal markers, highest proportion of African ancestry uh, in St. Kitts, um, uh, Jamaica, and the uh, highest proportion of Native American, as I mentioned earlier, Dominica, uh, which is a, um, a very interesting uh, island. So if we look at South America, one slide, please. <laughs> South America. Um, uh, in the, the uh, uh, Caco Valley of uh, uh, Colombia, um, this is actually what we call the um, Black Belt of South uh, America. Uh, high levels of West African ancestry in this population, uh, about 70%. This is based on uh, 200 ancestry informative markers. And about 15% uh, European and Native American ancestry. If we look further south in Uruguay, uh, vastly different uh, proportion of West African ancestry, mainly uh, European, and a lot of that is Italian European ancestry, and about 14% Native American. So this is um, uh, uh, very useful, even when we, we, we think about doing um, genetic studies in Hispanic populations, you definitely are going to have to account for that variation there in the proportion of genetic ancestry. Uh, my last slide. This is my last slide. So I, I want to put this up <laughs> to, to introduce this, for the, this topic for the next session, because what they're going to be talking about is estimating ancestry across uh, not only the genome, but even you know, uh, uh, across these chromosomes to um, uh, look at local uh, genetic ancestry. So in conclusion, significant heterogeneity. Uh, West African ancestry is predominant in most of the non-Spanish Caribbean. Uh, Native American high in the Dominica, and um, uh, all groups have some level of non-indigenous uh, uh, ancestry. Um, and we see evidence of sex bias gene flow throughout uh, the Americas. Um, one of the things we are going to uh, look at. <laughs> well, you keep talking, but walk over there. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right, okay. Okay, let's have the other panelists come up. So, um, Rick, you can keep talking. 